Chapter 15 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 My Experience as a Sick Man. Up to this time, I had never been sick a day in my life, that is, sick enough to ache and groan and grunt and lay in bed. At home I had occasionally had a cold, and I was put to bed at night after drinking a quart of ginger tea, and covered up with blankets in a warm room, and I was fussed over by loving hands until I got to sleep, and in the morning I would wake up as fresh as a daisy, with my cold all gone. Once or twice at home I had a bilious attack that lasted me almost twenty-four hours, but the old family doctor fired blue pills down me, and I came under the wire an easy winner. I did have the mumps and the measles, of course, before enlisting, but the loving care I was given brought me out all right, and I looked upon those little sicknesses as a sort of luxury. The people at home would do everything to make sick experiences far from bitter memories. It was getting along towards Christmas of my first year in the army, and though it was the sunny south we were in, I noticed that it was pretty all-fired cold. The night rides were full of fog and malaria, and one morning I came in from an all-night ride through the woods and swamps feeling pretty blue. The mud around my tent was frozen, and there was a little snow around in spots. As I laid down in my bunk to take a snooze before breakfast, I noticed how awfully thin an army blanket was. It was good enough for summer, but when winter came the blanket seemed to have lost its cunning. I was again doing duty as a private soldier, having learned that my promotion to the position of corporal was only temporary. I had been what is called a lance corpora, or a brevet corporal. It seemed hard after tasting of the sweets of official position to be returned to the ranks, but I had to take the bitter with the sweet, and a soldier must not kick. I had never laid down to sleep before without dropping off into the land of dreams right away. But now, though I was tired enough, my eyes were wide open and I felt strange. At times I would be so hot that I would throw the blanket off, and then I would be so cold that it seemed as though I would freeze. I had taken a severe cold, which had settled everywhere, and there was not a bone in my body but what ached. My lungs seemed of no use. I could not take a long breath without a hacking cough, and I felt as though I should die. It was then that I thought of the warm little room at home and the ginger tea and the soaking of my feet in mustard water and wrapping my body in a soft flannel blanket, and the kindly faces of my parents, my sister, my wife, everybody that had been kind to me. I would close my eyes and imagine I could see them all, and open my eyes and see my cold little tent and shiver as I thought of being sick away from home. I laid for an hour, wishing I was home again, and while alone there I made up my mind I would write home and warn all the boys I knew against enlisting. The thought that I should die there alone was too much, and I was about to yell for help when my tent mate, who had been on a scout, came in. He was a big green Yankee who had a heart in him as big as a water pail, but he wasn't much of a nurse. He came in nearly frozen, threw his saddle down in a corner, took out a hard tack, and began to chew it, occasionally taking a drink of water out of a canteen. That was his breakfast. "'Well, I've got just about enough of war,' said he, as he picked his teeth with a splinter off his bunk and filled his pipe and lit it. "'They can't wind up this business any too soon to suit the old man.' War in the summer is a picnic, but in winter it is wearing on the soldier. Heretofore I had enjoyed tobacco smoke very much, both from my own pipe and Jim's, but when he blew out the first whiff of smoke it went to my head and stomach and all up and down me, and I yelled in a hoarse pneumonia sort of voice, Jim, for God's sake, don't smoke. I am at death's door, and I don't want to smell of tobacco smoke when St. Peter opens the gate. "'What, pard, you ain't sick?' 
said Jim, putting his pipe outside of the tent and coming to me and putting his great big hand on my forehead, as tender as a woman. Great heavens, you have got the yellow fever. You won't live an hour. That was where Jim failed as a nurse. He made things out worse than they were. He, poor old fellow, thought it was sympathy, and if I had let him go on, he would have had me dead before night. I told him I was all right. All I had was a severe cold on my lungs, and pneumonia and rheumatism and chills and fever, and a few such things. But I would be all right in a day or two. I wanted to encourage Jim to think I was not very bad off, but he wouldn't have it. He insisted that I had typhoid fever, and glanders, and cholera. He went right out of the tent and called in the first man he met, who proved to be the horse doctor. The horse doctor was a friend of mine, and a mighty good fellow, but I had never meditated having him called in to doctor me. However, he felt of my foreleg, looked at my eyes, rubbed the hair the wrong way on my head, and told Jim to bleed me in the mouth, and blanket me, and give me a bran mash, and rub some mustang liniment on my chest and back. I didn't want to hurt the horse doctor's feelings by going back on his directions, but I told him I only wanted to soak my feet in mustard water and take some ginger tea. He said, all right, if I knew more about it than he did, and that he said he would skirmish around for some ginger while Jim raised the mustard, and they both went out and left me alone. It seemed an age before anybody come, and I thought of home all the time, and of the folks who would know just what to do if I was there. Pretty soon Jim came in with a camp kettle half full of hot water and a bottle of French mixed mustard, which he had bought of the sutler. I told him I wanted plain ground mustard, but he said there wasn't any to be found, and French mustard was the best he could do. We tried to dissolve it in the water, but it wouldn't work, and finally Jim suggested that he take a mustard spoon and plaster the French mustard all over my feet, and then put them to soak that way. He said that prepared mustard was the finest kind for pig's feet and sausage, and he didn't know why it was not all right to soak feet in. So he plastered it on, and I proceeded to soak my feet. I presume it was the most unsuccessful case of soaking feet on record. The old camp kettle was greasy, and when the hot water and French mustard began to get in their work on the kettle, the odor was sickening, and I do not think I was improved at all in my condition. I told Jim I guessed I would lay down and wait for the ginger tea. Pretty soon the horse doctor came in with a tin cup full of hot ginger tea. I took one swallow of it, and I thought I had swallowed a blacksmith's forge with a coal fire in it. I gasped and tried to yell murder. The horse doctor explained that he couldn't get any ginger, so he had taken cayenne pepper, which, he added, could knock the socks off of ginger any day in the week. I felt like murdering the horse doctor, and I felt a little hard at Jim for playing French mustard on me. But when I come to reflect, I could see that they had done the best they could, and I thanked them and told them to leave me alone, and I would go to sleep. They went out of the tent, and I could hear them speculating on my case. Jim said he knew I had diabetes and lung fever combined with sciatic rheumatism and brain fever, and if I lived till morning the horse doctor could take it out of his wages. The horse doctor admitted that my case had a hopeless look, but he once had a patient, a bay horse, sixteen hands high, and as fine a saddle horse as a man ever threw a leg over, that was troubled exactly the same as I was. He blistered his chest, gave him a tablespoonful of condition powders three times a day in a bran mash, took off his shoes and turned him out to grass, and in a week sold him for two hundred and fifty dollar. I laid there and tried to go to sleep, listening to that talk. Then some of the boys who had heard that I was sick came along and inquired how I was, and I listened to the remarks they made. One of them wanted to go and get some burdock leaves and pound them into a pulp and bind them on me for a poultice. He said he had an aunt in Wisconsin who had a milk sickness, and her left leg swelled up as big as a post, and the doctors tried everything and charged her over two hundred dollars and never did her any good. 
and one day an indian doctor came along and picked some burdock leaves and fixed a poultice for her and in a week she went to a hop picker's dance and was as kitteny as anybody and the indian doctor only charged her a quarter jim was for going out for burdock leaves at once for me but the horse doctor told him i didn't have no milk sickness he said all the milk soldiers got was condensed milk and mighty little of that and he would defy the world to show that a man could get milk sickness on condensed milk that seemed to settle the burdock remedy and they went to inquiring of jim if he knew where my folks lived so he could notify them in case i was not there in the morning jim couldn't remember whether it was atchison kansas or fort atkinson wisconsin but he said he would go and ask me while i was alive so there would be no mistake and the poor fellow meaning as well as any man ever did came in and asked for the address of my father saying it was of no account particularly only he wanted to know i gave him the address and then he asked me if he shouldn't get me something to eat i told him i couldn't eat anything to save me he offered to fry me some bacon and make me a cup of coffee but the thought of bacon and coffee made me wild i told him if he could make me a nice cup of green tea and some milk toast or poach me an egg and place it on a piece of nice buttered toast and give me a little currant jelly i thought i could swallow a mouthful jim's eyes stuck out when i gave my order which i had done while thinking of home and a tear rolled down his cheek and he went out of the tent saying all right pard i saw him tap his forehead with his finger point his thumb toward the tent and say to the boys outside he's got em head all wrong wants me to make him milk toast poached eggs green tea and currant jelly and i offered him bacon sow belly for a sick man there isn't a loaf of bread in camp not an egg within five miles and milk currant jelly why he might as well ask for delmonico's bill of fare but we have got to get em i told him he should have em and by mighty he shall here mr horse doctor you stay and watch him and i and company d here will saddle up and go out on the road to a plantation and raid it for delicacies you bet your life says the company d man and pretty soon i heard a couple of saddles thrown on two horses and then there was a clatter of horses feet on the frozen ground i have thought of it since a good many times and have concluded that i must have dropped asleep anyway it didn't seem more than five minutes before the tent nap opened and jim came in come straighten out here now you red-headed corpse and try that toast said he as he came in with a piece of hardtack box for a tray and on it was a nice china plate and a cup and saucer and egg on toast and a little pitcher of milk and some jelly jim i said tasting of the tea which was not much like army tea you never made this tea a woman made that tea or i'm a goat and that toast was toasted by a woman and that egg was poached by a woman where am i i asked imagining i was home again you guessed it the first time pard said jim as he threw the blanket over my shoulders as i sat up on the bunk to try and eat the whole thing was done by the rebel angel rebel angel jim what are you talking about there ain't any rebel angels and i became weak and laid down again yes there is a rebel angel and she is a dandy said jim as he covered me up she is out by the fire making milk toast for you you see i went out to the brown plantation to try and steal an egg and some bread and milk but i thought on the way out as it was a case of life and death the stealing of it might rest heavy on your soul when you come to pass in your chips so i concluded to go to the house and ask for it there was a young woman there and i told her the red-headed corporal that captured the female smuggler was dying and couldn't eat any hardtack and bacon and i wanted to fill him up on white folks food before he died so he could go to heaven or elsewhere as the case might be on a full stomach and she flew around like a kernel of popcorn on a hot griddle and picked up a basket of stuff and had the nigger saddle a mule for her and she came right to the camp with me and said she would attend to everything 
She's a thoroughbred, and don't you make no mistake about it. I must have gone to sleep when Jim was talking about the girl, for I dreamed that there was a million angels in rebel uniforms poaching eggs for me. Pretty soon I heard a rustle of female clothes, and a soft, cool hand was placed on my forehead. My hair was brushed back, a perfumed handkerchief wiped the cold perspiration from my face, and I heard the rebel angel ask Jim what the doctor said about me. Jim told her what the horse doctor had said about curing a horse that had been sick the same as I was, and then she asked if we had not sent for the regular doctor. Jim said we had not thought of that. She asked what had been done for me, and Jim told her about the French mustard episode and the cayenne pepper tea. I thought she laughed, but it had become dark in the tent, and I couldn't see her face. But she told Jim to go after the regimental surgeon at once, and Jim went out. The angel asked me how I felt, and I told her I was all right, but she said I was all wrong. I thanked her for the trouble she had taken to come so far, and she said not to mention it. She said she had a brother who was a prisoner at the North, and if somebody would only be kind to him, if he was sick, she would be well repaid. She said the last she heard of him he was a prisoner of war at Madison, Wisconsin, and she wondered what kind of people lived there, away off on the frontier, and if they could be kind to their enemies. That touched me where I lived, and I raised up on my elbow and said, why, bless your heart, miss, if your brother is a prisoner in old Camp Randall, in Madison, he has got a picnic. That town was my home before I came down here on this fool job. The people there are the finest in the world. All of them, from old Grosvenor Lewis to the poorest man in town, would set up nights with a sick person, whether he was a rebel or not. Your brother couldn't be better fixed if he was at home. The idea of a man suffering for food, clothing, or human sympathy in Madison would be ridiculous. There is not a family in that town, I said, becoming excited from the feeling that anyone doubted the humanity of the people of Wisconsin, but would divide their breakfast and their clothes and their money with your brother. Egad, I wish I was there myself. I will be responsible for your brother, miss. She told me to lay down and be quiet and not talk any more, as I was becoming wild. She said she was glad to know what kind of people lived there, as she had supposed it was a wilderness. In a few minutes Jim came back and said the doctor was playing poker with some other officers in a captain's tent, and he didn't dare go in and break up the game. But he spoke to the doctor's orderly, and he said I ought to take castor oil. That didn't please the little woman at all and she told Jim to go to the poker tent and tell the doctor to come at once, or she would come after him. It was not long before the doctor came stooping in to my pup tent. His idea was to have all sick men attend surgeon's call in the morning, and not go around visiting the sick in tents. He asked me what was the matter, and I told him nothing much. Then he asked me why I wasn't at surgeon's call in the morning. I told him the reason was that I was waiting in a swamp after the rebels that ambushed some of our boys the day before. Then you have got malaria, said he. Take some quinine tonight and come to surgeon's call in the morning. The little woman, the rebel angel, got her back up at the coolness of the doctor, and she gave him a piece of her mind, and then he called for a candle, and he examined me carefully. When he got through, he said, he is going to have a run of fever. He must be sent to the hospital. Jim, go tell the driver to send the ambulance here at once. And you, Jim, go along and see that this fellow gets to the hospital all right. He can't live here in a tent, and I doubt if he will in the hospital. That settled it. In a short time the ambulance came, and I got in and sat on a seat, and the rebel angel got in with me, and we rode seven miles to the hospital over the roughest road a sick man ever jolted over, and I would have died if I could have had my own way about it. But the little woman talked so cheerfully that when we arrived at the great building I should have considered myself well, only that my mind was wandering. All I remember of my entrance to the hospital was that when we got out of the ambulance Jim was there on his horse, leading the mule belonging to the angel. 
some attendants helped me upstairs and down a corridor where we met two stretchers being carried out to the dead house with bodies on them and i had to sit in a chair and wait till clean sheets could be put on one of the cots where a man had just died the little woman told me to keep up my courage and she would come and see me often jim cried and said he would come every day a man said your bed is ready number one ninety seven and i laid down as number one ninety seven and didn't care whether i ever got up again or not i just had breath enough left to bid the angel good-bye and tell jim to see her safe home jim said you bet your life i will and the world seemed blotted out and for all i cared i was dead End of chapter 15. Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina. Chapter 16 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 My Varied Experiences in the Hospital let's see last week i wound up in the hospital when jim my old comrade and the rebel angel left me i to all intents and purposes i supposed i was going to sleep but after i got well enough to know what was going on i found that for about ten days i had been out of my head it was not much of a head to get out of but however small and insignificant a man's head is he had rather have it with him keeping good time than to have it wandering around out of his reach when i come to as the saying is it only seemed as though i had been asleep overnight but i dreamed more than any able-bodied man could have done in one night i was what they call unconscious but i did a great deal of work during that period of unconsciousness one thing i did which i was proud of was to wind up the war I arranged it so that all of the bullets that were fired on each side were made of India rubber, like those little toy balloons, and war was just fun. The boys on both sides would fire at each other and watch the rubber balloons hit the mark and explode, and nobody was hurt, and everybody laughed. There was no more blood. Everything was rubber and wind. There was no one killed, no legs shot off, and the men on each side when not fighting with the harmless missiles were gathered together blue and gray having a regular picnic and every evening there was a dance the rebels furnishing the girls in my delirium i could see that my rebel angel was dancing a good deal with the boys and frequently with my comrade jim and i was pretty jealous i made up my mind that i wouldn't speak to either of them again I would watch my balloon battles with a good deal of interest, and think how much better and safer it was to fight that way. Every day when the battle was over and the two sides would get together for fun, I noticed when the bugle sounded for battle again that on each side the boys were terribly mixed, there being about as many blue-coated Yankees among the gray rebels as there were rebels among the Yankees, and after a while it seemed as though all were dressed alike in a sort of blue-gray, and then they disappeared, and I recovered my senses. Frequently, during my delirium and unconsciousness, I would feel my mouth pulled open and hear a spoon clink against my teeth, and I would taste something bad going down my neck, and then my head would buzz as though a swarm of bees had taken up their abode where my brains used to be. Sometimes I would hear the clinking of a saber and a pair of Mexican spurs, and feel a great big hand on my head and i knew that was jim but i couldn't move a muscle or say a word i guess he's dead ain't he doc i would hear in jim's voice and the doc would say there was a little life left but not enough to swear by then the doc would say you better come in about ten thirty tomorrow, as we bury them all at that hour and i guess he'll croak by that time I tried to speak and tell them that I was alive, and that I was going to get well, but it wasn't any use. I was tongue-tied. Again I would hear the sweet rustle of a dress and feel a warm hand on my head, 
and I knew that the rebel angel had rode her mule to town to see me. Then I would try hard to tell her that I was going to write a letter to the governor of Wisconsin, and ask him to look out particularly for her brother, who was a rebel prisoner at Madison, and take care of him, if he was sick. But I couldn't say a word, and after smoothing my hair a little while, she would give my cheek three or four pats, just as a mother pats her child, and she would go away. One morning, a little after daylight, I woke up and looked around the ward of the hospital. My eyes were weak, and I was hungry as a bear. I had to try two or three times before I could raise my hand to my head, and when I felt of my head it seemed awfully small. I could feel my cheekbones stick out so that you could hang your hat on them. My cheeks were sunken, and my fingers were like pipe stems. I wondered how a man could change so in one night. I saw two or three fellows over at the other end of the room, and I thought I would get up and go over there and have some fun with them. I wanted to know where my horse was and where I was. I tried to raise up and couldn't get any further than on my elbow. From that position I looked around to see what was going on and tried to attract the attention of some attendant. Finally I saw four fellows bringing a stretcher along towards my cot. They had evidently been told by the doctor that I would be dead in the morning, and having confidence in the word of the professional man had come to take me to the dead house before the other sick man was awake. As they came up to the foot of my cot and sat the stretcher down, I thought I would play a joke on them. I pulled the sheet over my face and laid still. One of the men said, Two of us can lift it, as it is thinner than a lath. To be considered dead when I was alive was bad enough. To be called it was too much. I felt one of the men take hold of my feet, and then I threw the sheet off my face, and in a hoarse voice I said, Say, Mr. Body Snatcher, you can postpone the funeral and bring me a porterhouse steak and some fried potatoes. Well, nobody ever saw a couple of men fall over themselves and turn pale, as those fellows did. Before I had given my order for breakfast, the two men had fallen back over the stretcher, and the two others were backing on as though a ghost had appeared. But finally they came toward me, and I convinced them that I was not dead. They seemed hurt to know that I was still alive, and one of them went off after the doctor to enter a complaint, I suppose. The doctor soon came, and he was the only one that seemed pleased at my recovery. He ordered some sort of gruel for me, but wouldn't let me have meat and things. I took the gruel under protest, but it did strengthen me. I told the doctor I wanted him to send for my horse, because I wanted to go out with the boys, but he said he guessed I wouldn't go out with the boys very soon. He said I might sit up in bed a little while, and when I did so, I found that I did not have my clothes on, but was clothed in a hospital nightgown, which was also used for a shroud for burial when a fellow died. He said Jim and the girl would be in about ten o'clock, as he had sent for them, and some of my comrades. I told him if I was going to entertain company and give a reception, I wanted my pants on, as I was sure no gentleman would give a reception successfully without pants. The doctor seemed sort of glad to see me taking an interest in human affairs again, and so he let me put my pants and jacket on. I got a butcher to shave me, and when ten o'clock came I looked quite presentable for a skeleton. I was sitting up in bed, with a little round zinc frame looking glass noting the changes in my personal appearance, when a door opened and Jim entered, dressed up in his best, with a rebel angel on his arm and followed by six boys from the regiment. They came in as solemn as any party I ever saw. The angel looked as sad as I ever saw anybody, and I thought she had probably heard that her brother was dead. It did not occur to me that they had come to attend my funeral. They stood there by the door, in that helpless manner that people always stand around at a funeral, waiting for the master of ceremonies to tell them that they can now pass in the other room and view the remains. I finally caught Jim looking my way, and I waved a handkerchief at him. He gave me one look and jumped over two cots and came up to me with tears in his eyes and a package in his hand and said, Pard, you ain't dead worth a cent. And then he hugged me and added, 
but there ain't enough left of you for a full-size funeral. Then he unrolled the package he had in his hand and dropped on the bed four silver-plated coffin handles. By that time the girl and the six boys had seen me, and they came over and we had a regular visit. They were all surprised to find me alive, as they had been notified that I was on my last legs and would be buried in the morning, and the captain had detailed the six boys to act as pallbearers and fire a salute over the grave, while Jim and the girl were to act as mourners. "'Well, it saves ammunition,' said Jim. "'But how be I going to get these coffin handles off my hands? "'There is no dependence to be placed on doctors anyway. "'When that doctor appointed this funeral, we thought he knew his business, "'and I told the angel, say I, "'my part ain't going to be buried without any style "'in one of those pine boxes that ain't planed and has got slivers on. "'So I hired the hospital coffin maker to sandpaper the inside and outside of a box "'and black it with shoe blacking and I went to a store downtown and bought these handles. Of course, pard, I am glad you pulled through and all that. But I want to say to you, if you had croaked in the night and been ready to bury this A.M., you would have had a more stylish outfit than anybody, except officers, usually get in this army. And the angel and I would have been a pair of mourners that would have slung grief so your folks to home would have felt proud of you. The angel was tickled to see me alive, and suggested to Jim and the boys that it was easy to talk a fellow to death after he had been so sick, and told them to go back to camp, and she would stay with me all day. So the boys shook hands with me, and Jim had an attendant to roll my cot up to a window so I could see my horse when they rode away. The boys got on their horses, and Jim led my horse, and I could see that my pet had been fixed up for the occasion. He had the saddle on, and it was draped with black. A pair of boots were fastened in the stirrups, and my carbine was in the socket. The idea was to have my horse, with empty boot and saddle, tied behind the wagon that took me to the cemetery, where soldiers wind up their career. It was not a cheerful thing to look at and to think of, but it did me good to see the old horse and the boys ride away in good health and happy at my escape and it encouraged me to make every effort to get well so I could ride with the gang. The rebel angel remained with me till almost night, and superintended my eating. No person who has never had a fever can appreciate the appetite of a person when the fever turns. I wanted everything that was ever eaten, and roast beef or turkey was constantly on my mind. As anything of that kind would have made use for Jim's coffin handles, I had to put up with soups and gruels. The doctor thought that this thin gruel was good enough, but it didn't seem to hit the spot, and so the girl asked the doctor if he thought nice gumbo soup and a weak milk punch wouldn't be pretty good for me. He said it would, but nobody in the hospital could make gumbo soup or milk punch. She said she could, and she told me not to eat a thing until she came back, and she would bring me a dish fit for the gods. She said she knew an old colored woman in town who cooked for a lady friend of hers, who had some gumbo, and the lady had a little brandy that was seventy years old, but she said the lady was a rebel, and I must overlook that. I told her I didn't care, as I had got considerably mashed on all the rebels I had met personally. She went out with a smile that would have knocked a stronger man than I was silly, and I turned over and took a nap the first real sleep I had had in a week. I woke up finally smelling something that was not gruel. Oh, I had got so sick of gruel. The angel handed me a glass of milk punch and told me to drink a swallow and a half. I have drunk a great many beverages in my lifetime, but I never swallowed anything that was as good as the milk punch that rebel girl made for me. It seemed to go clear to my toes, and I felt strong. Then she gave me a small soup plate and told me to taste of the gumbo. I had never tasted gumbo soup before, but I had no difficulty in mastering it. No description can do gumbo soup justice, or explain to a person who has never tasted it the rich odor and palatable taste. The little that I ate seemed to make a man of me again, instead of the weak invalid. Since then I have been loyal to southern gumbo soup, 
and have always eaten it whenever it could be obtained, and I never put a spoonful of it to my lips without thinking of the rebel girl in the hospital who prepared that dish for me. If I ever become a glutton, it will be on gumbo soup, and if I am ever a drunkard, it will be a milk punch drunkard, and the soup and the punch must be prepared in the South. Well, my experience after that in the hospital was about the same as a hundred thousand other boys in blue. Only few of the boys had such care and such food. The girl kept me supplied with gumbo soup and milk punch until I could eat heartier food, and in a couple of days I got so I could walk around the hospital. At home I had never been much of a hand to be around with the sick, but experience had been a good teacher and I found that going around among the boys and talking cheerfully did them good, and me too. I found men from my own regiment that I did not know had been sick. The custom was to make just as little show about sending sick men to the hospital as possible, hence they were often packed off in the night, and the first their comrades would know of their illness would be a detail to bury them. Or a boy would suddenly appear in his company looking pale and sick, having been discharged from the hospital. If the men had known how many of their comrades were sent to the hospital, it would have demoralized the well ones. For ten days I visited around among the sick men, telling a funny story to a group here and cheering them up and writing letters home for fellows that were too weak to write. I learned to lie a little bit in writing letters for the boys, one young fellow who had his leg taken off wanted me to write to his intended and tell her all about it, how the leg was taken off and how he was sick and discouraged and would always be a cripple and a burden on his friends, etc. I wrote the letter entirely different from the way he told me. I spoke of his being wounded in the leg, but that the care he received had made him all right and that he would probably soon have a discharge and be home and make them all happy. I thought to myself that if she loved him as a girl ought to, that a leg or two short wouldn't make any difference to her, and there was no use of harrowing up her feelings in advance, and that he could buy a cork leg before he got home, and maybe she would never find it out. I might have been wrong, but when he got an answer from that letter he was the happiest fellow I ever saw in this world, and he arranged at my suggestion to stop over in New York and get a cork leg before he went home. I have never learned whether the girl ever found out that he had a cork leg, but if she did and blames anybody, she can lay it to me. Lots of the boys that I wrote letters for wanted to detail all of their calamities to their mothers and sisters and sweethearts, but I worded the letters in a funny sort of way so that the friends at home would not be worried and the answers the boys got would please them very much. The hardest work I had was a couple of days writing letters for a doctor to relatives of boys who had died, detailing the sickness, death, and burial, and notifying friends that they could obtain the personal effects of the deceased, clothing, money, pipes, knives, etc., by sending express charges. It always seemed to me that if I had been running the government, I would have paid the express charges on the clothing of the boys who had died if I didn't lay up a cent. Finally, I got well enough to go back to my regiment, and one day I showed up at my company, and the first man I met saluted me and said, Hello, Lieutenant. I told him he did wrong to joke a sick man in that way, and I went on to find Jim. He was in our tent, greasing his shoes and he looked up with a queer expression on his face and said, Hello, Lieutenant. Look here, I said, as I grasped his greasy hand. What do you fellows mean by calling me names? I have never done anything to deserve to be made a fool of. Pard, what ails you, anyway? Didn't they tell you? said Jim, as he scraped the mud on his other shoe with a stick. The colonel has sent your name to the governor of Wisconsin to be commissioned as second lieutenant of the company. All the boys are tickled to death, and they are going to whoop it up for you when your commission comes. But this pup tent will not be good enough for you then, and old Jim will have to pick up another pard. You won't have to cook your bacon on a stick when you get your commission, and you can drink out of a leather-covered flask instead of a flannel-covered canteen but by the great horn spoons I shall love you if you get to be a jigadier brindle. 
and the old pard looked as though he wanted to cry like a baby. Jim, I said, I think the fellows are giving us taffy, and that there is nothing in this lieutenant business, but if there is, you will be my pard till this cruel war is over, and don't you forget it. And I went along the company street toward the colonel's tent, leaning on a cane, and all the boys congratulated me, and I felt like a fool. Lieutenant, I am glad to see you back, said the colonel, as I entered his tent, and he showed it in his face. What is the foolishness, colonel? I asked. The boys are all guying me. Can't I stay a private? End of chapter 16 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 17 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 Thanksgiving Dinner with the Rebel Angel The last chapter of this history wound up in my interview with the colonel, in which he told me that what the boys had said was true, and that I had a right to be called lieutenant. He said there was a vacancy in the commissioned officers of my company, caused by some discrepancy in regard to the ownership of a horse, which an officer had sold as belonging to him, when investigation showed that there was U.S. branded on the horse. The colonel said he had looked over the company pretty thoroughly, and while I was not all that he could desire in an officer, there were less objections to me than to many others and he had recommended the governor of our state to commission me. He said he didn't want me to run away with the idea that my promotion from private to a commissioned office was for any particular gallantry, or that I was particularly entitled to promotion, but I seemed the most available. It was true, he said, that I had done everything I had been told to do in a cheerful manner, and had not displayed any cowardice that he knew of though I had often admitted to him that I was a coward. He said he thought few men knew whether they were cowards or not until they got in a tight place, and that most men honestly believed they were cowards, but they didn't want others to know it, and they took pains to conceal the fact. He said he had rather be considered a coward than a daredevil of bravery, for if he flunked when a chance come to show his mettle, it wouldn't be thought much of and if he pulled through and made a decent record for bravery, he would get a heap of credit. He said he believed it took a man with more nerve to do some things he had ordered me to do than it did to get behind a tree and shoot at the enemy, and he was willing to take his chances on me. He congratulated me, and some of the other officers did the same. I was invited to sit into a game of draw poker with some of the officers, I pleaded that I was not sufficiently recovered from my sickness to play poker, and I went back to my tent to talk with Jim. I was thinking over the new responsibilities that were about to come to me, and figuring on the salary. A hundred and fifty dollars a month! It is cruel to raise the salary of a poor devil from thirteen dollars a month to a hundred and fifty. I wondered how in the world the government was ever going to get that much out of me. Certainly I couldn't do any more than I had been doing towards crushing the rebellion for thirteen dollars, and what would I do with so much money? In my wildest dreams of promotion I had never hoped to be a commissioned officer. I had thought sometimes, a week or two after I enlisted, that if I was a general I could put down the rebellion so quick the government would have lots of rations left on its hands to spoil but a few months' active service had taken all that sort of nonsense out of me, and I had been contented as a private. But here I was jumped over everybody, and made an officer unbeknown to me. It made me dizzy. I was not very strong anyway, and this thing had come upon me suddenly. I was thinking of the magnificent uniform I would have, and the fancy saddle and bridle, and the regular officer's tent with bottles of whiskey and glasses, when Jim asked me if I wouldn't just hold that frying pan of bacon over the fire while he cooked some coffee. He said we would just eat a little to settle our stomachs and then go out to Thanksgiving dinner. Thanksgiving dinner, I said. What are you talking about? 
"'Don't you know?' said Jim. "'Today is Thanksgiving. The angel told me last night to bring you out to the plantation today, and I was going after you at the hospital if you hadn't showed up. She has received a letter from her brother, who is a rebel prisoner at Madison, and he says a Yankee hotel keeper at Madison, that you had written to, had called at the pen where they were kept, and had brought him a lot of turkey and fixings, and offered to send him a lot for Thanksgiving, so the rebel boys could have a big feed. And he says he is well and happy, and is going to be exchanged soon, and she wants us to come out and eat turkey and possum. I had rather eat gray tomcat than possum, but I told her we would come. So we will eat a little bacon and bread, and ride out. Well, all right, Jim, I said. We will go, but in my weak state I can't be expected to eat possum. If there is anything of that kind to be eat, Jim, you will have to eat it. However, I will do anything the rebel angel asks me to do, I added, remembering her kindness to me when I was sick. The ride to the plantation, after several weeks' confinement, was better than medicine, and I enjoyed every step my proud horse took. The animal acted as though he had been told of my promotion, but it was plain to me that he acted proud because he had been resting during my sickness. It was all I could do to keep Jim alongside of me. He would fall back every little while and try to act like an orderly riding behind an officer. I had to discipline him before he would come up alongside like a partner. I mentioned this Thanksgiving dinner in the army in order to bring in a little advice the rebel girl gave me, which I shall always remember. We arrived at the old plantation house where the girl and her mother and some servants were living, waiting for the war to close so the men folk could come back. The old lady welcomed us cordially, the girl warmly, and the servants effusively. The dinner was good, though not elaborate, except the possum. That was elaborate, and next to gumbo soup, the finest dish I ever tasted. After we had got seated at the table, the old lady asked a blessing, and it was more like a prayer. She asked for a blessing upon all the men in both armies, and made us feel as though there were no bitterness in her heart towards the enemies of her people. During the dinner, Jim told of my promotion, and the circumstance was commented on by all, and after dinner the rebel angel took me to one side and said she had got a few words of advice to give me. She commenced by saying, Now that you are to be a commissioned officer, don't get the big head. During this war we have had soldiers near us all the time, and I have seen some splendid soldiers spoiled by being commissioned. Nine out of ten men that have received commissions in this locality have been spoiled. I am a few years older than you, and have seen much of the world. You are a kind-hearted man, and desire to treat everybody well, whether rich or poor, Yankee or Confederate. If you let this commission spoil you, you are not worthy of it. You will naturally feel as though you should associate with officers entirely, but you will find in them no better companions than you have found in the private soldiers, and I doubt if you will find as true friends. Do not, under any circumstances, draw away from your old friends, and let a barrier raise up between you and them. My observation teaches me that the only difference between the officers and men in the Union Army is that officers get more pay for doing less duty. They become dissipated and fast because they can better afford it. They drink more, put on style, play cards for money, and think the world revolves around them, and that they are indispensable to success. And yet when they die or are discharged for cause, private soldiers take their place and become better officers than they did, until they in turn become spoiled. I can think of no position better calculated to ruin a young man than to commission him in a cavalry regiment. Now take my advice. Do not run in debt for a new uniform and a silver-mounted sword, and don't put a stock of whiskey and cigars into your tent and keep open house, because when your whiskey and cigars are gone, those who drank and smoked them will not think as much of you as before, and you will have formed habits that will ill prepare you for your work. You will not make any friends among good officers, and you will lose the respect of the men who have known you when you were one of them, 
but who will laugh at you for getting the big head and going back on those who are just as good as you are, but who have not yet attained the dignity of wearing shoulder straps. I meet officers every day who were good soldiers before they were raised from privates, and they show signs of dissipation and have a hard look, leering at women and trying to look blasé. They try to act as near like foreign noblemen who are officers as they can from reading of their antics, but Americans just from farms, workshops, commercial pursuits, and the backwoods and country villages of the North are not of the material that foreign officials are made of, and in trying to imitate them they only show their shallowness. Do not, I beg of you, change one particle from what you have been as a private soldier, unless it is to have your pants fit better and wear a collar. Of course you will be thrown among officers more than you have been before. Imitate their better qualities, and do not compete with them in vices. Always remember that when a volunteer army is mustered out, all are alike. The private who has business ability will become rich and respected after the war, while the officer who has been promoted through favoritism and who acquires bad habits will keep going downhill and will be glad to drive a delivery wagon for the successful private whom he commanded and snubbed when he held a proud position and got the big head. Now, my convalescent red-headed Yankee, you have the best advice I know how to give a young man who has struck a streak of luck. Go back to your friends and may God bless you. Well, I had never had any such advice as that before, and as Jim and me rode back to camp that Thanksgiving evening, her words seemed to burn into my alleged brain. I could see how easy it would be for a fellow to make a spectacle of himself. What did a commission amount to, anyway, that a fellow should feel above anybody? When we arrived in camp and went into our tent to have a smoke, the chaplain came in. I had not seen much of him lately. When I was sick, I felt the need of a chaplain considerably. Not that I cared particularly to have him come and set up a howl over me, as though I was going to die, and he was expected to steer me the right way. But I felt as though it was his duty to look after the boys when they were sick, and to talk to them about something cheerful. But he did not show up when I needed him, and when he called at our tent after I was well, there wasn't that cordiality on my part that there ought to have been. He had a package which he unrolled after congratulating me on my recovery, and it proved to be a new saber with silver-mounted scabbard and gold sword-handle. The chaplain said he had heard that I was to be commissioned, and he had found that saber at a store downtown, and thought I might want to buy it. He said, of course, I would not want to wear a common government saber, as it would look too rude. He said he could get that saber for forty dollars, dirt cheap and I could pay for it when I got my first pay as an officer. I could see through the chaplain in a minute. He had thought I would jump at the chance to put on style, and that he could make ten or fifteen dollars selling me a gilt-edged saber. I thanked him warmly, and a little sarcastically, for his great interest in the welfare of my soul, in sickness and in health, but told him that I was going to try and pull through with a common private saber. I told him that the few people I should kill with a saber would enjoy it just as well to be run through with a common saber. My only object was to help put down the rebellion, and I could do it with ordinary plain cutlery as well as silver-mounted trappings. I said that to smear a silver-mounted saber all over with gore would spoil the looks of it. The chaplain went out when a drummer for a tailor shop came in with some samples and wanted to make up a new uniform for me regardless of expense. I stood him off and went to bed, tired, and thought I had rather be a private than a general. The next morning it was my turn to cook our breakfast, and I turned out and built a fire, cut off some salt pork, and was frying it, when the orderly sergeant came along and detailed Jim and me, with ten or a dozen others, to go to work on the fortifications. The rebels were preparing to attack our position, and the commanding officer had deemed it advisable to throw up some earthworks. I told the orderly that he couldn't detail me to work with a shovel, digging trenches, when I was an officer. But he said he could, until I received my commission, and was mustered in. I left my cooking and went to the colonel's tent. 
He was just rolling out of his bunk, and I said, How is it, Colonel? Can an officer be detailed to go and shovel dirt? I have been detailed by the orderly with a lot of privates to report to the engineer to throw up fortifications. That does not strike me as proper work for a commissioned officer. You will have to go said the colonel as he stood on one leg while he tried to lasso his other foot with a pants leg it may be three months before your commission will arrive and then you will have to go to new orleans to be mustered out as a private and mustered in as an officer until that time you will have to do duty as a private then what the devil did you say anything about my being commissioned for until the commission got here said i and i went back and finished cooking breakfast for myself and jim our detail went down to the river at the left of the line and reported to the engineer and were set to work cutting down trees, throwing up dirt, and doing about the dirtiest and hardest work that I had ever done. As a private I could have done anything that was asked of me, but the thought of doing such work while all the boys were calling me lieutenant was too much. I never was so crushed in my life. How glad I was that I did not buy that gilt-edged saber of the chaplain. We had to wear our side-arms while at work, fearing an attack at any minute, and I thought how ridiculous I would have looked with that silver-mounted saber hanging to me while I was handling a shovel like a railroad laborer. If that detail was made to humiliate me and reduce my proud flesh that had appeared on me by my sudden promotion, it had the desired effect, for by night I was as humble an amateur officer as ever lived. I had chopped down trees until my hands were blistered, and had shoveled dirt until my back was broke, and at night returned to my tent too tired to eat supper, and went to bed too weary and disgusted to sleep. And that was my first day as a commissioned officer. End of chapter 17 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 18 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 My Sickness and Hospital Experiences Have Spoiled Me for a Soldier. I became satisfied more each day that my sickness and experience in the hospital had spoiled me for a soldier. Being attended to so kindly by a rebel girl, and getting acquainted with her people, and hearing her mother pray earnestly that the bloodshed might cease, sort of knocked what little fight there was in me out, and I didn't hanker any more for blood. It seemed to me as though I could meet any rebel on top of earth and shake hands with him, and ask him to share my tent and help eat my rations. The fact of being promoted to a commissioned office didn't make me feel half as good as I thought it was going to, and I found myself wishing I could be a he-sister of charity, or something that did not have to shoot a gun or go into any fight. I got so I didn't care whether my commission ever arrived or not. The idea of respectable men going out to hunt each other like game became ridiculous to me and I wondered why the statesmen of the North and South did not get together and agree on some sort of a compromise and have the fighting stop. I would have agreed to anything, only, of course, whatever arrangement was made, it must be understood that the South had no right to secede. Then I would think, why, that is all the South is fighting for, and if they concede that they are wrong, it is the same as though they were whipped and of course they could not agree to that. I tried to think out lots of ways to wind the business up without fighting any more, but all the plans I made maintained that our side was right, and I concluded to give up worrying about it. But I made up my mind that I would not fight any more. I was still weak from sickness, and there was no fight in me. I thought this over a good deal, and concluded that if I was called upon to go into another fight, where there was any chance of anybody being killed, I would just have a relapse and go to the hospital again till it was over. I had heard of fellows being taken suddenly ill when a fight was in prospect, and I knew they were always laughed at, but I made up my mind that I had rather be laughed at than to hurt anybody. 
there was no thought of sneaking out of a fight because of the danger of being killed myself but i just didn't want to shoot any friends of that girl who had nursed me when i was sick these thoughts kept coming to me for a week or more and one evening it was rumored around that we were liable to be attacked the next day some of our regiments had been out all day and they had reported the enemy marching on our position in force the rebels that lived in town could not conceal their joy at the idea that we were to be cleaned out they would hint that there were enough confederates concentrating at that point to drive every yankee into the river and they were actually preparing bandages and lint to take care of the confederates who might be wounded if we had taken their word for it there wouldn't be a yankee left in town when the confederate boys begun to get in their work i went to bed that night resolved that i should not be so well in the morning and would go to surgeon's call and be sent to the hospital but i didn't like the way those rebels talked about the coming fight egad if they were so sure our fellows were going to be whipped maybe i would stay and see about it if they thought any of our fellows were going to slink out when they made their brags about whipping us they would find their mistake however if i didn't feel very well in the morning i would go to surgeon's call but i wouldn't go to the hospital in the meantime i would just see if i had cartridges enough for much of a row and rub up the old carbine a little for luck not that i wanted to shoot anybody dead but i could shoot their horses and make the blasted rebels walk anyway and so all that evening i was part of the time trying to see my way clear to get out of a regular fight where anybody would be liable to get hurt and again i was wondering if my sickness had injured my eyesight so that i couldn't take good aim at the buttons on a rebel's coat i was about half and half if the rebels would let us alone and not bring on a disturbance i was for peace at any price but gall blast them if they come fooling around trying to scare anybody i wouldn't go to a hospital not much i talked with jim about it and he felt about as i did he didn't want any more fighting and while he couldn't go to the hospital he was going to try and get detailed to drive a six mule team for the quartermaster but he cleaned up his gun all the same and looked over his cartridges to see if they were all right we got up next morning got our breakfast and jim asked me if i was going to the hospital and i told him i would wait till afternoon i asked him if he was going to drive mules and he said not a condemned mule not until the fight was over there was a good deal of riding around orderlies staff officers etc artillery was moving around and about eight o'clock some of our boys who had been on picket all night came in looking tired and nervous saying that they had been shot at all night and that the rebels had got artillery and infantry till you couldn't rest and they would make it mighty warm for us before night orders come to each company that no soldier was to leave camp under any circumstances to go to town or anywhere i told jim if he was going to drive mules he better be seeing the quartermaster sergeant but he said he never was much gone on mule driving anyhow but he said if he looked as sick as i did he would go to the hospital too quick i told him there wasn't anything the matter with me pretty soon over to the right near the river there was a cannon discharged it was not long before another went off around to the left and then a dozen twenty a hundred all along the line they were rebel cannon and pretty soon they were answered by our batteries then there was a rattling of infantry and the noise was deafening i expected at the first fire that our bugler would come out in front of headquarters and blow for heaven's sake for us to saddle up but for three hours we loafed around camp and no move was made it was tiresome we started to play cards several times but nobody could remember what was trumps and we gave that up some of our boys would sneak up onto a hill for a few minutes against orders and come back and say that they could see the fight and it was which and t'other then a few more would sneak off and after a while the whole regiment was up on the hill looking off to the hills and valleys watching rebel shells strike our earthworks and throw up the dust and watching our shells go over to the woods where the rebels were 
then i found myself hoping our shells were just paralyzing the johnnies presently the ambulances began to come by us loaded with wounded and that settled it when there was no fighting and i was half sick and felt under obligations to a confederate girl for taking care of me i didn't want any of her friends hurt but when her friends forgot themselves and come to a peaceable place and began to kill off our boys friendship ceased and i wondered why we didn't get orders to saddle up and go in we were all on the hill watching things when the colonel who had been riding off somewhere came along we thought he would order us all under arrest for disobeying orders but he rode up to us and pointing to a place off to the right a mile or so where there was a sharp infantry fight he said boys we shall probably go in right there about three p m unless the rebels are reinforced and he rode down to his tent well after about twenty ambulances had gone by us with wounded soldiers we didn't care how soon we went in there we watched the infantry and artillery for another hour as pretty a sight as one often sees it was so far away we could not see men fall and it was more like a celebration until one got near enough to see the dead presently the regimental bugle sounded boots and saddles and in a minute every man on the hill had rushed down to his tent even before the notes had died away from the bugle nothing was out of place every soldier had known that the bugle would sound sooner or later and we had everything ready it did not seem five minutes before every company was mounted in its street waiting for orders jim leaned over towards me and said hospital and i answered not if i know myself and i patted my carbine on the stock i said to him six mule team and he whispered back nary six mule team for the old man then the bugle sounded the assembly and each company rode up onto the hill and formed in regimental front facing the battle every eye was on the place where the colonel had said we would probably go in there never was a more beautiful sight and every man in the cavalry regiment looked at it till his eyes ached then came an order to dismount and every man was ordered to tighten up his saddle girth as tight as the horse would bear it and be sure his stirrup straps were too short rather than too long to a cavalry man those orders mean business then we mounted again and a few noticed a flag off to the right signaling the colonel noticed it and coolly gave the order fours right march we went off towards the fighting then right down by our own cannon and formed in line behind the infantry that was at work with the enemy the artillery firing over our heads at the confederates in the woods the noise was so loud that one could not hear his neighbor speak but above it all came a bugle note and glancing to the left another cavalry regiment and another formed on our left another bugle note and to the right another cavalry regiment formed and for half a mile there was a line of horsemen deafened though awaiting the command of some man through a bugle if the rebels had time to notice those four regiments of cavalry fresh and ready for a gallop they must have known that it was a good time to get away finally our artillery ceased firing and it seemed still as death except for the rattling of infantry in front of us the rebel artillery had ceased firing also and a great dust beyond the woods showed that they were getting away the bugle sounded forward and that line of cavalry started on a walk the infantry in front ceased firing and went to the right of us at a double quick and the field was clear of our men while our cavalry was walking they kept a pretty good line each man glancing to the right for a guide as we neared the place where our infantry had been stationed it was necessary to break up a little to pass dead and wounded without riding over them and when falling back to keep from hurting a wounded comrade a look at the line up and down showed that it was almost a mob with no shape but after getting forty rods we passed the field where men had fallen and the order to close up guide right was given and in an instant the line was perfect then came the order to trot and we went a short distance until the rebels could be plainly seen behind trees logs and in line firing 
We halted and fired a few rounds from carbines, and then dropped the carbines on orders. For a moment nothing was done, when officers ordered every man to draw his revolver, and when the six charges had been fired, after nearing the enemy, to drop the revolver in the holster and draw sabers, and every man for himself, but to rally on the colors, at the sound of the bugle, and not to go too far. Talk about being sick and going to the hospital, or driving mules? Coward as I was, and I knew it, there was something about the air that made me feel that I wouldn't be in the hospital that day for all the money in the world. All idea of being sorry for the enemy, all charity, all hope that the war might close before any more men were killed, was gone. After looking in the upturned faces of our dead and wounded on the field, the more of the enemy that were killed the better. It is thus that war makes men brutal while in active service. They think of things and do things that they regret immediately after the firing ceases. The next ten minutes was the nearest thing to hell that I ever experienced, and it seemed as though my face must look like that of a fiend. I felt like one. The bugle sounded forward, and then there was an order to trot, and the revolver firing began, with the enemy so near that you could see their countenances, their eyes. Some of them were mounted, others were on foot, some on artillery caissons, and all full of fight. It did not take long to exhaust the revolvers, and then the sabers began to come out, and the horrible word, CHARGE, came from a thousand throats, and every soldier yelled like a Comanche Indian. The line spread out like a fan, and every soldier on his own hook. Sabers whacked, horses run, everybody yelled. Men said, I surrender. What you jabbing at me for when I ain't fighting no more? Drop that gun, you Johnny, and go to the rear. Ones of pain and anguish, and awful sounds that a man ought never to hear but once. The business was all done in ten minutes. Many of our men were killed and wounded, and many of theirs were treated the same way. Those who could get away got, and those we passed without happening to hit them were prisoners, because the infantry followed and took them back to the rear. Jim and me stayed as near together as possible, and we noticed one young Confederate on a mule. His left arm was hanging limp by his side, and as Jim passed on one side of him and I on the other, he said, as he held up his right hand, I done got enough, and I surrender. The thing was about over, the bugle having sounded the recall, and we turned and went back with this confederate. He was as handsome a boy as ever fired a gun, and while he was pale from his shattered left arm and weak, he said, You gentlemen are all fine riders, sir. You fought as well as southern men, sir. That was a compliment that Jim and me acknowledged on behalf of the northern army, he couldn't have paid our regiment a higher compliment if he had studied a week. Then he said, I was a fool to be in this fight. I was a prisoner and was only exchanged last week. I might have remained at home on a furlough, but when our army came along yesterday and the boys said there was going to be a fight, I took my sister's mule, the only animal on the place, and came along, and now I am a cripple. I looked at the mule and I said to Jim in a whisper, I hope to die if it isn't the angel's mule. That must be her brother. Jim was going to ask him what his name was when we neared the place where our regiment was forming, and the surgeon of our regiment came along, and I said, Doc, I wish you would take this young fellow and fix up his arm nice. He is a friend of mine. Take him to our regimental hospital. Then we went back to the regiment. The prisoners were taken away and after marching around through the woods for an hour, we rode back to our camp, and the battle was over. Two or three hours later I went over to the regimental hospital and found the black-eyed Confederate with his arm dressed, and he was talking with our boys as though he belonged there. Someone asked how he happened to be there, and the old doctor said he believed he was a relative of one of our officers. Anyway, he was going to stay there. I gave him a bunch of sutler cigars and left him, and an hour later the angel showed up, pale as death, and wanted someone to go with her to the battle to help find the body of her dead brother. She said he had arrived home from the north the morning before, and had gone into the fight, 
and when the confederates came back defeated past their plantation her brother was not among them and she knew he was dead i have done a great many things in my life that have given me pleasure but no one that i remember of that made me quite so happy as i was to escort the girl who had been so kind to me to the hospital where her brother was his wound was not serious and he sat on a box smoking a cigar telling the boys the news from wisconsin he had just come from there where he was a prisoner and he couldn't talk enough about the kindness of the people of the Nawath. His sister almost fainted when she found him alive, then hugged him until I was afraid she would disturb his arm, and then she sat by him and heard him tell of his visit to Wisconsin. Before night he was allowed to go home with his sister on parole, and Jim and I were detailed to go and help bury the dead of the regiment. End of chapter 18 Recording by Arnold Banner Thurmond, North Carolina. Chapter 19 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 I Am Detailed to Drive a Six Mule Team. After the battle alluded to in my last chapter, it took us a week or more to get brushed up, the dead buried, and everything ready to go to living again. A battle to a regiment in the field is a good deal like a funeral in a family at home. When a member of a family is sick unto death, all looks dark, and when the sick person dies, it seems as though the world could never look bright again. Every time the relatives and friends look at any article belonging to a deceased friend, the agony comes back, and it is quite a while before there is any brightness anywhere. But in time the tear-stained faces become smiling, the lost friend is thought of only occasionally, and the world moves along just the same. So in the army. For a few days the thought of comrades being gone forever was painful, and no man wanted to ride the horse whose owner had been killed. But within a week the feeling was all gone and if a horse was a good one he didn't stay in the corral very long on account of some good fellow having been shot off his back. The boys who couldn't remember what was Trump's on the day of the battle, and a soldier has got to be greatly interested in something else to forget what is Trump's, returned to their card-playing, and no one would know, to look at them, that they had passed through a pretty serious scare and seen their comrades fall all around. We told stories of our experience in the army and at home, and entertained each other. I couldn't tell much except what a good shot I was with a shotgun and rifle, and I told some marvelous stories about hitting the bull's-eye. It got to be tiresome waiting around for my commission to arrive, and I did not quite enjoy being a commissioned high private. Everybody knew I had been recommended for a commission, and they all called me lieutenant but all the same I was doing duty as a private. For two or three days I was detailed to drive mules for the quartermaster, and that was the worst service I ever did perform. It seemed as though the colonel wanted to prepare me for any service that, in the nature of things, I was liable to be called upon to perform. I kicked some at being detailed to drive a six-mule team but the colonel said I might see the time when I could save the government a million dollars by being able to jump onto a wheel mule and drive a wagon loaded with ammunition or paymaster's cash out of danger of being captured by the enemy. So I went to work and learned to gee-haw a six-mule team of the stubbornest mules in the world, hauling bacon, but there was no romance in taking care of six mules that would kick so you had to put the harness on them with a pitchfork for fear of having your head kicked off. If I ever get a pension it will be for my loss of character and temper in driving those mules. I have been in some dangerous places, but I was never in so dangerous a place in battle as I was one day while driving those mules. One of the lead mules got his forward foot over the bridle some way, and I went to fix it, and the team started and straddled me. 
as soon as I saw that I was between the two lead mules and that the team had started, I knew my only safety was in laying down and taking the chances of the three pairs of mules and wagon going straight over me. To attempt to get out would mix them all up, so I fell right down in the mud, which was about a foot deep, and just like soft mortar. As the mules passed on each side of me, every last one of them kicked at me, and I was under the impression that each wheel of the wagon kicked at me. But I escaped everything except the mud, and when I got up on my feet behind the wagon, the quartermaster, who was ahead on horseback, had stopped the team. He called a colored man to drive and told me I could go back to the regiment. I tried to sneak in the back way and not see anybody, but when I passed the chaplain's tent, a lot of officers who had been sampling his sanitary stores come out, and one of them recognized me, and they insisted on my stopping and talking something with them. Honestly, there was not an inch of my clothing but was covered with red mud that every soldier remembers who has been through Alabama. They had fun with me for half an hour, and then let me go. I have never been able to look at a mule since without a desire to kill it. I had said so much about my marksmanship with a rifle that one day I was sent for by the colonel. He said he had heard I was a crack shot with the rifle, and I admitted that I was a pretty good shot. He asked me if I could hit a man's eye every time at ten paces. I told him I was almost sure I could. He said he had a duty that must be performed by some man that was an excellent shot, and I might report at once with forty rounds of ammunition. I don't know when I had been any more startled than I was at the colonel's questions and his manner. Could it be that he had some secret expedition of murder that he wanted to send me on? I had never deliberately aimed at a man's eye, and if there was anybody to be killed, I would be no hand to do it in cold blood. It seemed as though I had rather give anything than to kill a man, but that was evidently the business the colonel had in his mind. Was it a lot of prisoners that were to be killed in retaliation for some of our men who had been treated badly by the enemy? I reported shortly with my carbine and forty cartridges, and the colonel told me to go to a certain place on the bank of the river, a mile away, and report to the chaplain, who would be there to see that everything was done properly. Then, when I started off, I heard the colonel say to the adjutant that there were about forty to be killed, and while it seemed cruel, it had to be done, and he hoped they would suffer as little as possible. If I could have had my way, I wouldn't have gone a step. I reflected on the pained look on the colonel's face, and wondered why I was picked out for all these sad events. But I thought if the chaplain was there, everything would be all right. Arriving at the place, I found the chaplain sitting on a stump on a big bluff overlooking the river. He sighed as I came up and said, Death is always a sad thing. I told him that no one appreciated it more than I did, and I sighed also. But, said he, as he took a chew of navy plug tobacco, when death is necessary, we should make it as painless as possible. I have been studying this matter over a good deal, and trying to figure out how to make the death the least painful to these poor victims, and it has occurred to me that if we place them on the edge of the precipice and you shoot them through the brain, while at the same time I push them, they will fall down a hundred feet into the river, and if they are not killed instantly by having the brain blown out, they will certainly drown. How does that strike you? I thought the chaplain was about the most heartless cuss I ever heard talk about killing people, but I said that seemed to me to be the best way. But a cold chill went over me as I thought of shooting anybody through the head, and the chaplain pushing him down the cliff into the water. I was just going to ask him what the men had done when he said, Ah, here they come. I looked, and a lot of colored men were leading about forty old back-number horses and mules afflicted with glanders and other diseases. "'Are the niggers to be killed?' I asked. "No," nah, said the chaplain, "'the horses and mules.' I was never so relieved in all my life as I was when I found that my excellent marksmanship was to be expended on animals instead of human beings, but I did feel hurt. The idea of a brevet officer— a man qualified to do deeds of daring, being detailed one day to drive mules, 
and the next to shoot sick horses. But I decided to do whatever I had to do well, and so preparations were made for the executions. The glandered horses were brought out first, and then the ones with sore backs. Many of them were first-rate horses, their only fault being sores made from the saddles, and as it would take months to cure them up, and as the army was going to move soon, it had been decided to kill them rather than leave them to fall into the enemy's hands, or take them along to be cured on the march. I shot about a dozen glandered horses, that being the largest game I had ever killed, and the bodies fell down into the river. Then there was a mule that was ugly, and it occurred to me I would have some fun with the chaplain. We were outside the lines, and quite a number of men had gathered from the plantations on hearing the firing to see what was up. I suggested to the chaplain that it was a shame to kill so many good horses when they might be of use to some of the planters, but he said they were all rebels, and it was not the policy of the government to set them up in business by giving them horses to use tilling crops. I argued that the men had come home from the Confederate Army, this was in 1864, either discharged for wounds or disability, or paroled prisoners, and they were anxious to go to work, but that they hadn't a dollar, and our army had skinned every horse and mule on their places, and the niggers had gone, so that a horse would be a godsend to them. But the chaplain wouldn't hear of it. The men who had collected were mostly too proud to ask for a horse from a Yankee, but I could see that they did not like to see the animals killed. I thought if I could get the chaplain, who had been sent out to the execution as a sort of humane society to see that the animals were killed easy, to go back to camp and leave me alone with the horses, I could kill them or not, as I chose. They brought out the ugly mule next, and my idea was to shoot the mule through the tip of the ear while the chaplain stood near with a rail to push it over the bank and maybe the mule would flax around and kick the chaplain up a tree, or scare him so he would leave. I took deliberate aim at the mule's ear, told the chaplain to push hard with the rail so the corpse would be sure to go over the cliff, and fired. Well, I have never seen such a scene in all my life. The mule seemed to squat down when the bullet hit the top of his ear. Then he brayed so loud that it would raise your hat right off your head. Then he jumped into the air and whirled round and kicked in every direction with all four feet at once, fell down and rolled over toward the chaplain, and got up, and seeming to think the chaplain was the author of the misery, started for him. And that good man dodged behind trees until he got a chance to climb up one, which he did, and sat on a limb and shook his fist at the mule and me. He used quite strong language at me for not killing the animal dead. Finally the niggers caught the mule, and the chaplain dismounted from the limb and came to me. I told him my carbine was out of order, and I should have to take it apart and fix it, and that there was no knowing whether it would shoot where I aimed it or not, after it was fixed, and I might have trouble with the rest of the horses. It would take an hour at least to fix the gun. He said he guessed he would go back to camp and leave me to finish up the slaughter, and that was what I wanted. The colored men were anxious to go back, too, so I let them tie the horses to trees and all go back except one whom I knew. After they had all gone, I went up to the dozen southern men who had been watching the proceedings and asked one who was called Colonel by the rest if he didn't think it was wrong to kill the horses when by a little care they could be of so much use in tilling crops. "'Well, sir,' said he with dignity, "'if it is not disloyalty, sir,' for a southern gentleman to criticize anything that a Yankee does, I should say, sir, that it was a damn shame, sir, to steal our horses, and after using them up, sir, kill them in cold blood, sir. Each one of those animals, sir, would be a gold mine, sir, at this time, to us who have come from the war, sir, destitute, with nothing but our bare hands to make a crop to keep our families from want, sir. The other gentlemen nodded at what the colonel had said, as though that was about their sentiments. I told him that I felt about that way myself, but there was an objection. 
if i gave the horses away for use on the plantations and the animals should be used hereafter in the confederate army it would not only be wrong but i would be liable to be dismissed from the army the colonel said he should want to be dismissed from the yankee army if he was in it but i might feel different about it but he said he would pledge me his word as a southern gentleman that if the animals could be lent to them they should never be used for war purposes he said he was poor and his friends there were poor but they would not take a horse as a gift from a stranger but if i would lend them the horses for a year they would use them and return them to the proper officer a year hence if the army was yet in existence or they would take them in exchange for horses that had previously been stolen from them by our army he said there was not a gentleman present but had lost from two to a dozen horses since the army had been in their vicinity i admired the dignity and honesty of the old gentleman and i knew mighty well that we had picked up every horse we could find and i said colonel here are about thirty horses i have been ordered to kill if i do not kill them i take a certain responsibility i feel under obligations to many southern people for courtesies and i feel that the nursing i received during a recent sickness from one of your southern ladies about the same as saved my life i believe the war is very near over and that neither you nor our men will have occasion for much more active service you have come home to your desolate plantations and found everything gone this is the fate of war but it is unpleasant all the same if you can use these animals for your work in raising crops you may take them in welcome and if there is any cussing i will stand it my advice would be to take them to some isolated place on your plantation and keep them out of sight for a time our army will move within a week and perhaps never come back here the animals are branded u s which will always remain if the horses are found in your possession later you may have to say that they were given to you by an agent of the quartermaster if they are taken from you grin and bear it if you are permitted to keep them and they do you any good i shall be very glad if i get hauled over the coals for giving aid and comfort to the enemy i will lie out of it some way or stand my punishment like a little man the horses are yours as far as i am concerned well sir you are a perfect gentleman sir said the colonel as he took my hand and shook it cordially and i should be proud to entertain you at my place sir we have got little left sir but you are welcome to our home at any time i am an old man with a bullet in my leg two of my boys are dead in virginia sir and i have one boy who is a prisoner at the north if he comes home alive we will be able to make a living and have a home again the war has been a terrible blow to us all sir i reckon both sides sir have got about enough and both sides have made cussed fools of themselves when this affair is settled sir the north and south will be better friends than ever sir i wish you a long life sir the other gentlemen expressed thanks and they picked out two or three horses apiece and led them away it seemed to me as happy a lot of gentlemen as i ever saw i called the colored man and we started for camp for a five dollar bill and a promise to always take a deep interest in the colored man's welfare i got his promise that he would never tell anybody about my giving the horses away and for nearly a year he kept his promise I went back to headquarters and reported that the animals had been disposed of, and that evening I was invited to set into a poker game with some of the officers, and when we got up I had won over a hundred dollars. I looked upon the streak of luck as a premium for my kindness to the gentleman who took the horses, but some of the officers seemed to have a suspicion that I concealed cards up my sleeve. It is thus that the best of us are misunderstood. End of chapter 19 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 20 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 I Demonstrate That Gambling Does Not Pay 
when I went away from the party of officers where we had been playing draw poker with a hundred dollars in my pocket, which I had won from men who thought they were pretty good poker players, I felt as though I owned the earth. I had my hand in my pocket, hold of the roll of greenbacks, and in that way constantly realized that I was no common pauper. I had never thought that I was an expert at cards, but this triumph convinced me that there was more money to be made playing poker than in any other way. I figured up in my mind that if I could win a hundred dollars a night and only played five nights a week, I could lay up two thousand dollars a month. To keep it up a year would make me rich, and if the war lasted a couple of years I could go home with money enough to buy out the best newspaper in Wisconsin. It is wonderful what a train of thought a young man's first success in gambling or speculation brings to him. I went to bed with my hundred dollars buttoned inside my flannel shirt, and dreamed all night about holding four aces, full hands, and three of a kind. All that night in my sleep I never failed to fill when I drew to a hand. I made up my mind to break every officer in the regiment at poker and then turn my attention to other regiments, and win all the money the paymaster should bring to the brigade. I got up in the morning with a headache, and thought how long it would be before night when we could play poker again, and I wondered why we couldn't play during the day, as there was nothing else going on. It got rumored around the regiment that I had cleaned the officers out at poker the night before, and the boys seemed glad that a private had made them pay attention. I had not yet got my commission, and so any victory I might achieve was considered a victory for a private soldier. Several of the boys congratulated me. The nearest I ever come to quarreling with my old partner Jim was over this poker business. I showed him my role and told him how I had cleaned the officers out, and instead of feeling good over it Jim said I was a confounded fool. I tried to argue the matter with Jim, but he couldn't be convinced, and insisted that they had made a fool of me, and had let me win on purpose, and that they would win it all back, and all I had besides. He said I had better let the chaplain take the hundred dollars to keep for me, and stay away from that poker game, and I would be a hundred ahead. But I didn't want any second-class chaplain to be a guardian over me, and I told Jim I was of age and could take care of myself. Jim said he thought I had some sense before I was commissioned, but it had spoiled me. He said in less than a week I would be borrowing money of him. I knew better, and went around camp with my thumbs stuck in my armholes, and felt big. It was an awful long day, and I put in the time thinking how I would draw cards and bet judiciously, and finally night came, and I went over to the major's tent, where the officers usually congregated. I was early and had to wait half an hour before the crowd showed up. As they came in, each had something to say to me. Here's the man who walked off with our wealth last night, said one. Here's our victim, said another. We will send him to his tent tonight without a dollar. They chaffed me a good deal, but I made up my mind that I could play as well as they could, and some of them were old fellows that had played poker before I was born. Well, we went to work, and the first hand I got I lost ten dollars. It was the history of all smart Alex, and there is no use in going into details. In less than an hour they had won the hundred dollars and fifty that I had sewed inside my shirt to keep for a rainy day, and they had joked me every time I bet until I was exasperated to such an extent that I could have killed them. Winning or losing money with them was a mere pastime and they seemed to enjoy losing about as much as winning. I was too proud or too big a fool to leave the game when I had lost all I had, and I borrowed a little of each of them and lost it, and then I said I was tired and guessed I would go to bed, and I went out dizzy and sick at heart, and the officers laughed so I could hear them clear to my tent. On the way to my tent, and as I walked around for half an hour before going there, I thought over what a fool I was, how I had forgotten all the good advice ever given me by friends. 
knowing that i was not intended by nature for a gambler i had gone in with my eyes open made a temporary success got the big head as all boys do and gone back and laid down my bundle and become the laughing stock of the whole crowd i figured up that i was just an even hundred dollars out of pocket and decided that i would never try to get it back i would simply swear off gambling right there forget that i knew one card from another pay up my gambling debts when i got my first pay and never touch a card again that was the wisest conclusion i ever come to after i had walked around until my head cleared off a little i went in the tent sly and still to go to bed without letting jim hear me i was ashamed and i didn't want to talk i heard jim roll over on his bunk and he said bet ten dollars pard that you lost all you had jim i won't bet with you i have sworn off betting entirely help yourself said jim as he reached over his greasy old pocket-book to me take all you want now that you have come to your senses but you must admit that what i said about your being a fool was true yes and an idiot and an ass i said as i handed back jim's money but that settles it i will never gamble another cent's worth as long as i live and if i see a friend of mine gambling i will try and break him of the habit there is nothing in it and i went to sleep and didn't dream any more about winning all the money in camp two days before christmas our cavalry consisting of a full brigade started on a raid or a march through the enemy's country and as i could not act as an officer very well before my commission arrived and as the colonel seemed to hate to see me in the ranks when i was looked upon as an officer he sent me to brigade headquarters on a detail to carry the brigade colors the brigade colors consisted of a blue guidon on a pole the butt end of the pole or staff was inserted in a socket of leather fastened to my stirrup and i held on to the staff with my right hand when on the march guiding my horse with my left hand when the command halted the colors were planted in the ground in front of the place which the brigade commander had selected on the march i rode right behind the brigade commander and his staff with the bodyguard to protect the precious colors i was glad of this position because it took me among high officials and if there was anything i doted on it was high officers the colonel had told me that i must be on my good behavior and salute the officers of the staff whenever they came near me he said the brigade commander was a strict disciplinarian and wouldn't put up with any monkey business the first hour of my service as color-bearer came near breaking up the brigade i was perhaps forty feet behind the brigade commander and his staff riding as stiff as though i was a part of the horse and feeling as proud as though i owned the army suddenly the colonel and staff turned out of the road and faced to the rear and started to ride back to one of the regiments in the rear i saw them coming and felt that i must salute them how to do it was a puzzle to me if i saluted with my left hand it would be wrong besides i would have to drop the reins and my horse might start to run as he was prancing and putting on as much style as i was if i saluted with my right hand i should have to let go the flagstaff the salute must be sudden so i could grasp the staff very quick before it toppled over it took a great head to decide what to do and i had to decide quick just as the brigade commander got opposite me i let go the flag staff brought my right hand quickly to the right eye as nice a salute as a man ever saw and returned it to grab the flag staff but it was too late as soon as my right hand let go of the staff it fell over and the gilt dart on the end of the staff struck the general's horse in the flank he jumped sideways against the adjutant general's horse and his horse fell over the brigade surgeon's horse the general's horse run under a tree and brushed the general off and the whole staff was wild trying to hold their horses and jumping to catch the general's horse and pick the general off the ground in the meantime my horse had got frightened at the staff and flag that he was dragging on the ground with one end in the socket in the stirrup the pole tickling him in the ribs and he began to dance around and whirl and knock members of the color guard off their horses 
and they stampeded to the woods, leaving me in the road on a frightened horse, whirling around, unmanageable, the staff striking trees and horses, until the staff was broken. The regiment in the rear of us saw the commotion, saw the general dismounted, and the colors on the ground, and a general stampede in front, and, thinking the general and staff had been ambushed by the rebels and many killed, the colonel ordered his men forward on a charge, and in less time than it takes to write it, the woods were full of charging soldiers, looking for an imaginary enemy. A surgeon had opened up a lot of remedies, and all was confusion, and I was the innocent cause of it all. I had seen my mistake as soon as the flagstaff knocked the general off his horse, and when I dismounted and picked up the flag and the pieces of the staff, and found myself surrounded by excited troops, I wondered if the general would pull his revolver and shoot me himself, or order some of the soldiers to kill me. For choice I had rather have been killed by a volley from a platoon of soldiers, but I recognized the fact that the general had a perfect right to kill me. In fact, I wanted him to shoot me. I was trimming the limbs off a sapling for a makeshift flag staff when I saw the crowd open and the general walk towards me. His face was a trifle pale, except where the red clay from the road covered it, and I felt that the next moment or two would decide in what manner I was to meet my doom. I remembered what the colonel had told me about the general being a strict disciplinarian, and wondered if it wouldn't help matters if I should fall on my knees and say a little prayer, or ask him to spare my life. I wondered if I would be justified in drawing my revolver and trying to get the drop on the general, but I had no time to think it over, for he come right up to me and said, I beg your pardon, my young friend, for the trouble and annoyance I have caused you. I should have known better than to ride so near you and frighten your horse when you had only one hand to guide the animal. Are you hurt? No? Well, I am very glad. Ah, the flagstaff is broken. Let me help you tack the flag on the sapling. Orderly, bring me some nails. Let me whittle the bark off the sapling so it will not hurt your hands. When we get into camp tonight and the wagons come up, I will see that you have another staff. There, don't feel bad about it. There is no damage. Bless his soul, I could have hugged him for his kindness. When he came towards me, I was mad and desperate, and when he spoke kind words to me, my chin trembled, and I felt like a baby. He stopped the brigade for half an hour to help fix up my flag, and all the time talked so kindly to me that when the thing was fixed, I felt remorse of conscience and said, General, I am entirely to blame myself. I tried to perform the impossible feat of saluting you and holding the colors at the same time, which I am satisfied now cannot be done successfully. Lay it all to me. I knew it, said the good old general, and I was going to tell you that you are not expected to salute anybody when you have the colors. You are a part of the flag, then. You will learn it all by and by. And he mounted his horse and rode away about his business, as cool as though nothing had happened, and left me feeling that he was the best man on earth. Further acquaintance with the old man taught me that he was one of nature's noblemen. He was an Illinois farmer who had enlisted as a private, and had in time become colonel of his regiment, and had been placed in command of this brigade. Every evening he would take an axe and cut up firewood enough for headquarters, and he was not above cleaning off his horse if his servant was sick or did not do it to suit, and frequently I have seen him greasing his own boots. Two days out and we were in the pine woods of Alabama, with no habitation within ten miles. After a day's march we went into camp in the woods, and it was the afternoon before Christmas. The young pines growing among the larger ones were just such little trees as were used at home for Christmas trees, and within an hour after getting the camp made every man thought of Christmas at home. The boys went off into the woods and got holly and mistletoe, and every pup tent of the whole brigade was decorated, and they hung nose bags, grain sacks, army socks, and pants on the trees. Around the fires, stakes had been driven to hang the clothes on to dry, and as night came and the pitch pine fires blazed up to the tops of the great pines, it actually looked like Christmas, 
though there was not a Christmas present anywhere. After supper, the brigade band began to play patriotic airs, with occasionally an old-fashioned tune like Old Hundred. The woods rung with music from the boys who could sing, and everybody was as happy as I ever saw a crowd of people, and when it came time to retire, the band played Home Sweet Home, and three thousand rough soldiers went to bed with tears in their eyes, and every man dreamed of the dear ones at home, and many prayed that the home ones might be happy, and in the morning they all got up, stripped the empty Christmas stockings off the evergreen trees, put them on, and went on down the red road, and at noon the army entered Montgomery, Alabama, the first capital of the Confederate States, took possession of the Capitol building in which were millions of dollars of Confederate money and bonds. Every soldier filled his pockets and saddlebags with bonds and bills of large denominations. It was a poor soldier that could not count up his half a million dollars, but with all the money no man could buy a Christmas dinner. A dollar in greenbacks would buy more than all the wagon loads of Confederate currency captured that day, and yet the people of Montgomery looked upon the arrival of the Yankees much as they would the arrival of a pestilence. However, it was not many days before a better understanding was arrived at, and Yankee blue and Confederate gray got mixed up, and acquaintances were made that ripened into mutual respect, and in some cases, love. End of chapter 20 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina